Hi everyone, first of all I would just like to apologise that Justina is not in this video so if you're here for her, uh, sorry it's just my face today. She's currently poorly, she's behind the camera and she's getting some rest. On the 6th of February, Turkey and Syria were hit by two massive earthquakes. Fortunately for us, all that happened is it woke us up. We were almost 400 kilometers away from the epicenter but it was still enough to rock the van to the point where we woke up. The first one struck at 17 minutes past 4. By the time it got to us, it was about 20 past 4. And the second earthquake we actually felt as well, and we actually managed to catch on video. Uh, we'd moved spot and, um, yeah, basically we felt, a, we felt a van rocking, which happened at around 1.24. It quickly became apparent that these earthquakes were not small, they were massive. 7.8 and a 7.5 and we had a choice we could either stay uh, inland where it was very cold and do nothing uh, and just kind of stay out of the way of the earthquake area be safe uh, you know don't put any stress on on uh, the areas that have been affected or go down to the south where the weather was warmer and actually do something to try and help so after maybe sleeping on it and day of thinking we came up with the decision to go south and um, to try and do something because we're here we have time we have a little van we can fill up with stuff so that's what we did so we went to the supermarket in Axaray and loaded up some things um, we got some baby nappies we got water we got baby wipes we got hot water bottles uh, um, thermal socks and blankets so we drove down to Tarsus which is about 200 kilometers away from the epicenter a relatively safe place where they still have things in stock in supermarkets and a good point to kind of be on standby in case we did find something to do. We managed to donate our things we bought to the Tarsus municipality who then distributed those things to uh, people in need. We don't know exactly where they went but we know they went somewhere. And then we bumped into Richard and Sarah and they were actually in Gaziantep the day before the earthquake uh, which is just like mind-blowing. Uh, and they'd also been in touch with a bunch of organizations and people trying to find out how they can help because they had the same feeling as us we're here we've got time we can help and it turns out they did manage to make a good contact and uh, it looked like that we could join them as well so so the next morning we drove to Adana the next town over to start unloading a lorry full of supplies and goods that had come from Istanbul there were a lot of volunteers there but mostly just to help unload the lorry. So once the truck was unpacked, uh, the, the guys from the organization asked us, okay, do you guys want to help out and deliver this stuff to places in need? And of course we said yes. So we filled up our van with face masks, absolutely full to the brim. We also filled up Richard and Sarah's van with face masks. Uh, they had some blankets, some sanitary towels, other things like that, stuff that is in need. And we headed towards Iskenderun. At this point it was the evening and the plan was to go to Iskenderun during the night time um, but the team decided it would be better to stay at a rest stop which meant we had to sleep in the front of our vans because they were all loaded in the back. The other guys, there were a couple of other cars like a small van and a car, everyone had to sleep in the front. Um, it was quite uncomfortable. It was only for a couple of hours because we were up bright and early the next morning to go and deliver these things. So we were up bright and early and we made our way to Iskenderun and one of the first things we saw was a big black cloud of smoke and that was from the port of Iskenderun and it was basically on fire. Uh, the earthquake made the containers fall over. You may have seen a picture in the news, I'll put it up here. Uh, and there was a fire and it was still burning several days later. And uh, this, this was like the first shocking thing we saw uh, because you could, you could see it, it was still burning. The scale of it was huge and the air quality was horrible. As we started to enter the city, you could see damaged buildings, some still standing, some completely collapsed. Um, and it was a bit, uh, yeah, shocking to see. And then we arrived at the hospital to deliver the masks and uh, that was not, um, it was not very easy basically. Um, we saw people uh, in body bags being unloaded just dropped off by random cars uh, and taken into the hospital. Um, yeah, it's it's something that uh, that will that will stick with us probably forever. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we, we dropped off the masks and then we made our way to a shelter camp, which was not too far from the hospital. And we basically distributed, um, we had a truck full of stuff as well. We had our cars, we had our vans and we had a truck, uh, a small truck full of things. And um, yeah, basically the people lined up and took what they needed. And we went out in teams to go out to each individual tent and ask them what they need, how much and how much they need of it. And then we made our way back to Adana because uh, we'd finished our supplies and we'd empty everything. And there, was an, uh, there were two trucks coming full of supplies from Istanbul again, which had to be unloaded and loaded back up. Fast forward a couple of hours, the trucks were unloaded and we decided to head back to Iskenderun to the same camp where we turned up and were told uh, everything's under control now, more aid has been delivered and they don't actually need what we, what we have. So uh, we were told then to go to the prison where there were also many people uh, sheltering and we got told at the prison uh, there's no help needed here. We started the drive away. Five minutes later, we got a phone call from the prison. Hey guys, come back. We do actually need the stuff. And then we delivered the stuff to the prison. Yeah, that was a bit weird. There was some kind of misunderstanding, miscommunication between the, the police and the army. Don't know exactly what happened there. It made us go back and forth a bit. It was a bit frustrating. But in the end, we managed to deliver the stuff that was needed. Then we headed back to our safe rest pod between Adana and Iskenderun. Uh, where we managed to get a massive three hours of sleep for the second night in a row. And for the next morning the plan was to drive to Adayaman, which is a place further away from where we have been, but also heavily affected by the earthquake. It's quite close to the epicenter. Um, but we went there empty because the organization have a warehouse there. And the plan was to drive there and load up there and distribute things to nearby villages. While we were delivering stuff to the prison on the previous day, uh, we also had Julian and Morgan join us with their camper van. They, they drove all the way from Antalya to Adana to load up their van full of stuff. And then they made their way to, straight to Adayaman. They, they had a crazy day of driving. They started at 5 p.m. and they finished at 2 a.m. After a little drive through Adayaman, we could see a lot of destruction again. I'll put some videos and pictures here. Uh, it was also pretty hard and shocking to see. Um, like for example, rescue teams and just loads of people waiting for those rescue teams hopefully to find somebody, somebody that they're waiting for. Um, yeah, a lot of destruction and I don't know, the scale of it is, is just massive. The size of this earthquake is huge. If you don't know how big it is, uh, I'll put it, yeah, it's, it's massive. Then we arrived at the warehouse and uh, we were just kind of waiting around. Um, it seemed like more miscommunication going on between the teams and we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, and in the end, in the end we met up with our smaller truck um, and we split our stuff into all the different individual cars and vans and we ended up distributing stuff. We, go, we split up again and distributed things to little villages um, outside Adayaman because the problem with this earthquake is the scale of it and the bigger cities get attention but the, the smaller villages they may be harder to get to or just just people don't think about them so uh, they do kind of get forgotten about so we drove to a small village with our van and a smaller little van uh, four of us and we basically had some blankets we had um, sleeping bags, mm, we had some clothes, we had some dry food, pasta, chickpeas, rice, uh, bulgur, um, we had some power banks, and we had torches, and we had batteries, and candles, and um, yeah, basically that stuff uh, went to a small village. In a small village, everything looked alright, there wasn't any like destruction, they could all stay in the houses just fine, uh, but they did have some issues with uh, like supply of getting food because their big supply of food normally in the shop is it doesn't it, you know the shop doesn't really exist anymore so it's a bit harder for them to get their food out in the rural villages after that we were invited into a family's house for a cup of tea 
uh, to thank us for what we've done and then we met up with the rest of the team who'd finished their deliveries as well. At this point it was dark and we had to make our way back to somewhere safe to sleep. We didn't really want to sleep in a dime man. And we basically, the three vans, Sarah and Rich, Julie and Morgan and us, uh, and we had one car in front of us. We basically got stuck in traffic in the center of a diamond and it, we just, I don't know, we kind of felt like we shouldn't be there. It was just gridlocked. The police were controlling the traffic because there were rescue teams uh, on the street and they had to close the streets. At some points we had to drive on the opposite side of the road and other points we were just standing still for half an hour, I don't know. The air was so bad we had to wear masks and you have all of these tall buildings around you and you're not sure like <laughs> you know you're not sure how stable they are to be honest and from that day we didn't really feel like the reward was worth the risk at that point because we just kind of felt like sitting ducks we felt like we were adding to the problem rather than taking away from the problem and um yeah, that, that kind of, that was how our last day felt. Hopefully you appreciate this uh, honest chat because it's, it's, yeah, we helped, but at the same time, not everything was smooth. We slept somewhere at a petrol station, like two hours away from a dying man. Um, it was safe, it was fine. We felt a little earthquake at night. And the next morning we woke up and another thing is with the clothes, um, there's definitely no shortage of clothes. The problem is they just kind of seem to get dumped in random places. Uh, like you'll see on the side of the road a big pile of clothes. Uncovered, just out in the open. And I don't know who they're going to. I don't know what the goal is there. But it was the same at the petrol station. Just in the corner of this random petrol station. A big pile of clothes that were just going nowhere. And they're just going to get wet and dirty. And no one's going to take them. On our way back from the random petrol station, we still had a couple of boxes left. So we found a another big camp where the rest of the things were distributed. And then we made our, a long way back to Adana and we said goodbye to the team. And that was basically it. The team, they had to go back to Istanbul. And, well, that was it. So we said our, we said our goodbyes to the team. And then we decided to hang out with Julian and Morgan, Sarah and Richard. So we went to the beach uh, just to sort of relax and reflect on everything we just done and we just saw. Uh, and yeah, we spent a nice few days together. We also kind of stayed in the area just to be on standby, just in case. Um, and we almost did something else, but it was a similar thing. Like it would be a lot of driving just for one day. And for us, the risk and reward wasn't quite uh, in line. And also, just a couple of days ago, there was another big earthquake, a 6.4, followed by a 5.8, which we felt in Tarsus, and it was really, it rocked the van a lot. So to summarize, uh, we did what we could, and there's a lot of help happening, but organization is not always there. That is seems to be the main problem. Um, lots of help, but... Uh, getting to those places and getting the stuff to the right people that uh, it's a bit of the issue uh, but yeah we we I think we're finished for now with the earthquake stuff we've we're, as you can see we're in Cappadocia it is, it's absolutely beautiful and it's very safe um, because there's some warnings like uh, the earthquakes kind of moving and they were moving towards the area we were in and we didn't want to stay in those potentially risky areas we'll still be on standby I um, just yesterday I managed to connect two people, a German couple and a Turkish guy. A Turkish guy with a lot of contacts, German person with some money they wanted to spend and together they managed to buy a load of dry food and supplies and the Turkish guy has delivered it straight to Iskenderun to a place where they need it. So yeah, sometimes stuff is happening in the background. We're kind of on standby if there's any emergency that requires us and the van. But yeah, for now, that's it. That's our experience of the earthquakes. Um, sorry about the talking, talking head video, but uh, it's just something we we wanted to share. And um, and yeah, 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching, and if you can, keep an eye on Turkey and give it any support that you can because they need it right now.